Ray Peters. Uh, a lot of you know him very well. Uh, he's a fellow truck driver, except uh, he does the construction work, and I just do the packaging work of it. Uh, he's a really good man, and I have, I'm pretty sure that what he has to speak about this morning will be spiritual and lighting. So, Ray, whenever you're ready to come up, it'd be great to have you. Everyone give him a warm welcome, please. Thank you all for coming today. I'm uh, honored to uh, have you here. I'm calling my uh, little talk today the story of my life. A couple of favorite verses of mine are uh, Philippians chapter 1 verse 6 says, There has never been the slightest doubt in my mind that the God who started this great work in you would keep at it and bring it to a flourishing finish. I'm sure you, like me, want to finish well. And once you get into your uh, 60s and so on, you begin to see that finish line out there, and uh, you sure want to finish well. One of the things I have learned as I have looked at older men uh, is it's easy to become a grumpy old man and uh, just negative about a whole lot of things, and I don't want to do that. Paul also says in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulations, that we may be able to comfort those who are in similar troubles with the comfort that we, excel, we ourselves experienced. I've kind of divided my life into three sections. One is I call the early years which is birth to 20, and I'm not going to talk about that today. Uh, the second section is the pastoral years, which is the next 28 years, and uh, I'm not going to talk about that either. I'm going to talk about the truck driving years and how that all began. Life often, uh, some of the experiences of life are called game changers. It's like a getting a call from a doctor, and he says, I need to see you. And you go in, and he says, uh, the x-rays uh, show some spots, and uh, we're kind of concerned. It's a game changer. Or it's a call from the police, and they say, uh, there's been an accident. And suddenly, everything changes. Or it can be a, a spouse, and you've heard about people going through this. Uh, the spouse suddenly says to you, um, I've, I've met someone else, and uh, you'll be getting a, we're going to divorce. Game changers. Or an employer says, uh, calls you, boss calls you into the office, and he says, uh, uh, we're downsizing, and uh, uh, there's not room for you anymore in this organization. It's a game changer. Well, life for us was uh, going according to plan, uh, but I was about to experience the worst day of my life and begin a long, dark, and very painful season. And only in the last couple of years have I actually been able to talk about it. Dorothy and I had just returned from a summer vacation and uh, uh, got a call and said, There's, uh, we're having a board meeting tonight and we want you to be there. And the date was September the 1st, 1998. I got to the board meeting and the district superintendent was there and not all the board members, a couple of board members. And uh, he said, here's a letter. And uh, the letter said, and I, I read the letter at the time, of course, and then I put it away and I haven't even looked at it until I start getting ready for this. But the letter said, after much prayerful consideration, we are hereby requesting your resignation. I thought I'd be able to get through this, but I can't. We are hereby requesting your resignation as senior pastor of this church. Um, well, that was tough. I was dismissed and uh, I, I went home. 
And uh, I was stunned and shocked and uh, I was crying. It was really, really hard. I was the shepherd. I cared for these sheep of mine. And uh, I've always been a people pleaser. And so when people aren't pleased with what I'm doing, it's uh, just very, very hard. And uh, I was a provider, just like you guys are. And uh, I'm thinking, well, what, what am I going to do now? What do I do next? And so I felt rejected, unneeded, and unwanted. And I was sitting there on the, uh, in our living room. Uh, Dorothy was beside me. And uh, just feeling absolutely the worst I've ever felt in my life. And uh, just, you know, nobody wants me, nobody needs me. I don't know if you've ever been there, but that's, that's pretty low. And uh, I looked up, and at that time we just had three grandkids, and I saw the pictures of the three grandkids. And, uh, And I said to Dorothy, they need me, don't they? And she said the most encouraging words, I think, that I've ever heard her say. And I will never forget these words. She said, we all need you. God bless her for saying those words. I will never forget them. They gave me just a flicker of hope and a reason to go on. I was wanted and I was needed. And uh, maybe I suspect some of you uh, have kind of been there too, where you just uh, uh, you wonder, does anybody notice me? Does anybody care? Am I any good? And uh, that's kind of where I was. Well, the next weeks are just kind of a blur. I hardly remember them. There was a uh, farewell service kind of at the church. It was, it was very uncomfortable. People were confused and uh, uh, it was just kind of embarrassing. Now, in my situation at that time, even though I had tremendous need for people to encourage me, I was too embarrassed to call for help. But I wish people would call me. I, I was just sort of too low to reach out. And if I had to go get some groceries, I would walk in the stores with my eyes down. I didn't want to see anybody. I didn't want anybody to uh, uh, ask how I was doing. Uh, it, was, it was just a very, very tough time. I wrote in a journal at that time, and uh, this is what I said. I begin this journal a month and a half after being asked to resign and immediately clean up my office. There is no opportunity to bring gradual closure to our ministry here, or to try to help people understand how all of this happened, or why. I too cannot, six weeks after, understand the why. Now, I know that sometimes we kind of say silly things that we don't really mean, but I was talking to my daughter about that time, and uh, I said to her, you know, it would almost have been better if I'd have committed adultery, because then I'd at least know what I'd done. I'd at least know what to fix. I said, now I, I don't know what the issues are. I don't know what to fix. And uh, she said, very wisely again, <coughs> I'm sorry. She said, Dad, uh, no, that would not have been better. Psalm 37 says, Do not fret. Trust in the Lord and do good. Delight yourself in the Lord. Commit your way to Him. Trust in Him. And be still before the Lord. And then the commentary about that says that anger and bitterness and worry are very destructive emotions. 
They reveal a lack of faith that God loves us and is in control. We should not worry. Instead, we should trust in God, giving ourselves to him for his use and safekeeping. When I dwell on my problems, I will become anxious and weary. But if I concentrate on God and his goodness, I will find peace. And so the question is, where will I focus? And I decided that rather than focusing on my problems and my difficulties, I would focus on God and what God was doing, and then try to work in step with Him. About that time, Henry Blackaby wrote the book, Experiencing God, and he says, God is always at work in your life. Be alert to the circumstances and watch for, uh, it had to be God, it had to be God moments, or I call them I spy, I see God at work. That could only have been a God thing that made that happen. <clears throat> now what we went through came at a staggering cost. It was no small thing. Uh, first of all, for the church, uh, the church has never recovered. Uh, for our family and friends and neighbors, there too was a staggering cost. We had several neighbors at the time who, when this happened to us, they just backed right off and said, we're out of here. Um, even for the three men who had signed the letter, um, within a year, two of them were divorced and the third one uh, disappeared. I have no idea where he is. And so, uh, one of the things that I, since that time, have just vowed to be very careful of is to be critical of church leadership or uh, particularly something as drastic as uh, trying to get a pastor to lead. Because the cost to these three men was uh, staggering. And for us too, there was, even though we've come out, landed on our feet, uh, there was like, very significant costs, like a career change, huge financial cost, but uh, we survived. I now want to talk to you about uh, my years as a trucker. The big windshield of a truck has been described as the great picture window. You have an amazing view of an ever-changing countryside out your big window. I got into trucking in this way. I was just kind of staying at home the first several weeks, and one of the men in church was, he drove a small, it was actually a cube van, and he was involved in the expediting business. That means you pick up a parcel, for example, in Toronto, and you've got to take it to maybe Phoenix, uh, just as quick as you can. It's called expediting. Get it there as quick as you can. Now he just had a small truck, like I said, a cube van, and he said, uh, he said to me a couple of times already, he said, Ray, would you like to just ride with me? And so finally I said, sure, I'll ride with you. And uh, so we had one of those long trips, and in the daytime, uh, of course, I sat in the passenger seat, and uh, uh, you kind of have to keep driving, and it didn't require a special license because it was so small. And so he said, would you like to drive for a while? And so I drove for a while, and then nighttime came, and I was getting tired, and I said, uh, so where do we sleep? I knew we didn't have a bunk. He said, we're just in the back. And uh, I knew what was in the back. It was some two-by-fours and a small parcel that we were hauling. And I said, so, like, where? And he said, well, just pile the two-by-fours up on each side a little bit, and uh, uh, then just sleep on the floor. <laughs> and so this was winter time and it was cold and so I had a parka on and the back was unheated and he had just cut a, a hole kind of uh, behind the seat so you could get into the uh, back so I crawled through the hole there was a blanket in front of it and so uh, there I am on my in my parka boots on and uh, uh, trying to go to sleep had a little two by four for a bit of a pillow and, um, and I'm thinking, boy, if they could see me now, <laughs> how, how embarrassing this would be for me. Uh, so that's how I started. 
And then after a while, uh, I did a few trips with him, and then one time he had uh, some appointments, and he said, Ray, would you take the truck this time? And so I did. And then I uh, uh, drove for another guy for a while, and then Dorothy and I decided, to, well, we'll do this for a few years. And so we bought our own truck, a much bigger truck, and uh, uh, got into the expediting business ourselves. Now, there's some good things about being a trucker. On the positive side, first of all, uh, in the few years that we did this, I saw 46, or I was in 46 of the 48 lower states. Uh, and so we saw lots of beautiful, beautiful country. But there's a lot of stresses for also. For example, uh, just for those of you who have never driven uh, like an over-the-road truck, uh, for us, these are some of the stresses that I experienced. Uh, getting loads can be a difficult uh, thing. Uh, our dispatcher would say, for example, Ray, you're to be in Toronto at, at the OSF office at 2 o'clock and you have a load that you're supposed to have in New York City by 5 o'clock in the morning. And so you get there at 2 o'clock and you tell them you're there and then you start to wait. And uh, you can't go to sleep because uh, uh, they may call you at any time and you have to be ready to jump in and, and get your load. And so you wait and it's 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock, 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock, and you're still waiting for your load. And you know that once you're loaded, you've probably got 9 hours to get to New York City if you drive steady. Finally at 9 o'clock, you get your load. And, uh, and now you know that you have to just keep driving, you can't sleep. And uh, uh, truck drivers often drive very, very, very tired. And so you're doing all kinds of things with your face just to try to uh, stay awake. And uh, often, obviously, uh, guys do fall asleep at the wheel and uh, it's very bad for everybody. Now, I drove before there were GPSs, and so uh, if you're driving in an unfamiliar area, finding the address can also be very, very stressful. And you usually have deadlines. You've got to be at the loading dock, uh, like at 5 o'clock or 3 o'clock or whenever, and, uh, and you have to find the place, and that can be very, very hard. Uh, driving at night, you're often sleep deprived and just very, very tired. One time, I w one of those very tired times, I was driving uh, to the East Coast and it was winter time and uh, I was just so tired, just kind of a zombie and I pulled off at a truck stop, or at a highway, interstate stop and uh, I had to go to the bathroom and uh, uh, I, I remember it so well. <coughs> and uh, so I found the bathroom and uh, I walked in and he's uh, kind of a zombie. And I looked, uh, oh, there's no uh, urinals in this bathroom, but maybe that's the way it is in New York on the interstates. And so uh, I, I walked in and uh, nobody there. And so I went into a little stall and, and then I sort of began to wake up and I thought, whoa. What if this, <laughs> this is a ladies' washroom? And then uh, I heard somebody come in, and I looked over the door, and sure enough, it was a lady with long blonde hair, and I thought, oh boy, now how do I get out of here? And I heard a stall open, and I got out of there so fast, and now I was wide awake. <laughs> yes. Weather can also be very interesting. I remember well uh, seeing where a tornado had just passed through in Oklahoma and all the damage it had done with the trucks being twisted around and buildings just turned over. One time I was uh, in Dallas and uh, at a truck stop and we were having, we were in the uh, restaurant of the truck stop and uh, uh, we were watching the TV and there were tornado warnings and uh, suddenly uh, somebody comes in and he says, everybody out of the restaurant and into this, the center of the building because uh, uh, tornado is, is right around here and so we've got to get 
away from the windows to the center of the building. Uh, and uh, the tornado did come down, but not on our building, a big high rise, just a little, uh, about a mile or so away, the next door, the next day I saw uh, where windows had been uh, pulled out and so on. I remember also one time we were going to Miami in Florida and uh, a hurricane was coming and uh, every, and there was an evacuation order for Miami and the interstate northbound was just solid with traffic and we were southbound because we had to drop, we had to make a drop at a mall in Miami and uh, so you could just go as fast as you wanted, nobody else on the interstate and uh, so we found where we had to go, quickly made our drop and then uh, uh, headed north with everybody else. Uh, it's a lonely life being a truck driver, especially an over the road truck driver where the longest I was not able to come home one time was five weeks. And when you're doing that for a while, you, uh, you miss birthdays and uh, uh, you don't see anybody you know. Uh, so I remember uh, this one time was, was five weeks, it was, it was lonely. And one of the things at truck stops is uh, sometimes there's uh, uh, prostitutes there. I remember in Kansas City, I was, it was nighttime and uh, all my lights were off, I was watching TV and suddenly there's a knock on my truck door. And I thought, what in the world? And here it's a sweet little girl about 14 or 15 year old, years old, and she says, uh, would you like to have a good time? And I looked at her and I thought, wow, she is somebody's daughter. Somebody's sister. And I knew what pigs truck drivers could be. And, uh, and I, I just said no. That was before I knew about human trafficking and all of that kind of stuff. And I thought she was there because she wanted to be there, but probably she had to be there. She didn't know anything else. And uh, other experiences like that with women knocking on the door. And I'm so glad that uh, God just delivered me from, uh, or spared me, I should say, uh, from ever getting involved in any of that. Uh, just because of regrets, and it's, it's so good not to have those. Um, after, after I'd driven alone for some time, Dorothy and I began to team drive. This is where the truck can keep rolling 24 hours a day, uh, seven days a week. And so she drove with me, actually, for about a year and a half. Now that has some good things about it, but also some things that aren't quite so easy. Can you imagine <laughs> no matter how much you love your wife, if you and she are in a bathroom size room 24-7, you kind of get on each other's nerves sometimes too. And, um, and also it's really not a great life. And uh, so after about a year and a half I said, Dorothy, I, you know, I appreciate you willing to go with me, but this is just too hard for you. She's uh, got arthritis problems and things like that, and uh, it, it's just no life uh, for her. Now one of the other kind of uh, uh, things also that I was beginning to experience at that time, and uh, those of you who have gray hair will understand this, those of you who don't have gray hair, you don't understand this, um, was prostate issues. And uh, uh, once you what uh, once you begin to develop prostate issues, when you have to go, you have to go like now. And um, it was okay when I was on the interstate. You could just pull over and do what you had to do. But if you're in a city and, uh, and you have to go, that was very, very uh, anxious times. But the worst times was missing family, missing birthdays, and so on. So those are some of the hard times. But one of the things I want to particularly emphasize today is that uh, we need to keep our eyes open so that we can experience God in unexpected places. I mentioned before that uh, often I was lonely 
and I saw no one I knew for days and weeks at a time, but I could often see that I was really not alone, that God was involved in my life and bringing people exactly when and where I needed them into my life. And so I played this game called I Spy, where I spy God at work, or that had to be a God thing. I'll give you an example. Uh, I was down south, I don't remember what city it was in, uh, staying at a truck stop, and, uh, and it had just been kind of a, a lonely, routine, dry day. And I said, God, I sure would like to know, I was, and I was walking from the uh, uh, restaurant to another area, and uh, I said, God, I sure would just like to hear from you in some way, just, just so I know I'm not alone. And I was walking by a shoe shine stand, and there was this young man, shining, a little black guy, shining somebody's shoes. And, uh, and as I'm walking by, in that little three-second window, I heard him say to the guy whose shoes he was shining, I shine shoes for Jesus, and when I get a chance, I talk about him. Just as I'm walking by, and, uh, and I said, I spy. God's at work. In Memphis, when I was there on a weekend, I liked to go to Adrian Rogers Church. It was a large church. And one of the things about large churches is that they have large parking lots, and so I could easily park the truck. And so I was in Adrian Rogers Church, and I signed a guest a card, a visitor's card, and uh, after the service, there was a meeting for newcomers, and I, I thought, okay, I'll go to the newcomers class. I've got nothing else to do. And uh, so we're there, just a bit of a lunch, and uh, suddenly he's, he waves this card, and he says, uh, where's my Canadian truck driver friend? And I thought, wow, somebody, somebody noticed me. Somebody was aware that I was around. And uh, I'll never forget it. I'll skip a bunch of years, and I'll talk about my last load. Um, I was, it, was in, it was to Atlanta. I had to make a, a stop or a drop in Atlanta. And uh, I was, so I was at this truck stop. I had already made my drop, and I couldn't pick up a, load, a return load until Monday. And I wanted to go to Dr. Stanley's church. And so I'm in this truck stop, and I'm looking at this huge map. And uh, I had the address, but, you know, Atlanta's huge. And a young man, I'm going to say early 20s, comes up beside me, and he says, so where do you want to go? And I said, well, you've probably never heard about this, but I said, I'd like to go to Dr. Stanley's church tomorrow morning. And he said, oh, I used to go to that church. I go to his son's church now. And uh, I said, really? Uh, where is it? And he said, well, if you'd like to, I could, I could drive you there in the morning. And I said, no, no I, have, I have a truck. Uh, and he said, oh. Uh, he said, they actually have a parking lot for big trucks. I said, you're kidding. And uh, so uh, he said, he showed me exactly how to get there. And so I went and I found this parking lot and, and uh, but he was there exactly when I needed somebody to show me how to get to Stock Dr. Stanley's church. And he knew exactly how to get there. Um, so I went to the church and again really enjoyed the first service and I decided nothing better to do, I'll stay for the second service too. And so between services I was looking at, this, uh, at their uh, bulletin boards. And a lady comes up to me and she says, uh, are you a visitor here? I don't think I've seen you here before. And I said, well, yeah, I, I drive a truck. And, and she said, where are you going for lunch? And I said, well, I, I really am not sure yet. I was going to go to the second service, and then I'll just go to the truck and see what, what's up. And she said, well, would you like to have lunch with us? She said, my husband and I, every Sunday, we bring an extra, uh, uh, extra food in our slow cooker, uh, just for people like you, that we can just invite and have lunch with 
after, uh, after the second service. And I thought, thank you, Lord. I gained some wonderful, wonderful people who just bumped into me when I most needed them. And here he's a, a retired airline pilot who did a couple of mission trips every, every year. And they did this little thing. That was a ministry that they had at the church. Just bringing some food, showing hospitality to lonely people like me. Um, so, uh, Monday morning, this is on my last, my last pickup now. I'm on my way back to Toronto, but I have a pickup to make just outside of Atlanta. And uh, I'm in a bathroom, and uh, I hear this guy humming. And he's humming a Christian song that I recognize. And I uh, said, I recognize your song. What, what, what's the song you're singing, or you're humming? And uh, he named it, and I said, so are, are you a Christian? And he said, uh, yes. I said, what do, you, what do you do? And he said, well, I'm a church planter, but in order to help the church so they don't have to pay me much money, I, I clean bathrooms and I plant churches. And I thought, wow. On my very last pickup, God is again, even though I don't see my family, I see members of the Christian family, it seems, over and over again. And so I thank God for him and I pray for him and with him. So I'm on my return to Toronto. I'd already sold my truck. And there's a guy waiting for me uh, with the money. And uh, I was to meet him in this parking lot of a, uh, of a mall. And uh, the truck, I was going to sell the truck for 12500 And I didn't want to check. I wanted either money order or cash. But I thought he'd have big bills. <laughs> so I called my brother-in-law and I said, Wayne, would you meet me at such and such a place? Um, because I'm going to have a lot of cash that this guy's giving me and I don't, I don't know who he is. And this was in Brampton and Brampton's kind of a place you got to watch yourself. And this guy, uh, I meet him and he's got um, $12,550 $12, bills. 250 <laughs> $50 dollar bills. That takes a while to count that. That's quite a stack. So I counted a bunch of them. I said, here, Wayne, you take these, go count them. And, uh, and I kept on counting. But uh, that was a lot of money, a lot of cash to have with strangers. I'm almost done. Finally, uh, I titled this little ne next little section, God Will Make You Whole. All of us, sooner or later, encounter sorrows. And we can let our sorrows make us better or bitter. And uh, I have a book, it's called Don't Waste Your Sorrows. Don't waste the hard times. And so about uh, three or four years after being asked to leave Barry, um, uh, they sent us an invitation saying, would you uh, come back and speak at an anniversary service? And I thought about it for a minute, and, or for some time actually, and uh, I said, uh, yes, uh, sure. And so uh, uh, we decided to go back and stayed with some friends overnight. And so um, the Saturday night, the, our hostess asked, uh, uh, Ray, are you gonna be okay going into the church? And I said, Yes, I'll be okay going into the sanctuary. I just don't want to go into the office room, boardroom area. Because that's, uh, that's where I got the letter and I, I just don't want to go there. And, uh, but I said I don't have to go there, so I'll be fine. So in the morning, I get up and uh, I was cleaning up and I realized, good night, I forgot my shaver. Um, but that's okay, I'll ask Ross for his and everything will be fine. And so when Ross got up, I said, Ross, can I just borrow your shaver? And he said, uh, I, I don't have an electric shaver. Uh, oh, but he said, I, I'll just ask one of the neighbors and they'll have an electric shaver and we'll let you use that. Nobody had an electric shaver. And uh, so he said, well, I'll call the pastor and I'll ask him to bring his shaver. And uh, the pastor said, well, we're not gonna be there this morning, but he can just go into the office and uh, get my shaver there. 
And um, so I said, okay, if I have to go up there, I'll go up there. And you know what? I went up to the office, through the boardroom, used the shaver. And even though I had been very afraid of going to that spot, uh, it really wasn't that big a deal. And God showed me that day, Ray, face your fears. And you will usually find that they're not nearly as big a deal as you think you are, as they, you think they are. And I realized, too, that God wants to make us whole. He doesn't want to be, us to be afraid of this over here, and this over here, and this over here. He wants us to be whole. So I don't have that parish anymore. I now have a new parish. Most of you know that I work uh, for my son, uh, who, had, who was going to be here, but he couldn't be here, but his son is here. Uh, this is my grandson Jordan over here. And uh, uh, so we now have three generations that work in Peter's Excavating. Jordy is still in uh, school, but uh, he works for Darren in the summertime, he works full time. And I consider the 40 or so employees that we have my new parish. And, uh, and I love them, try to connect with them in ways that we can, even though, like most construction workers, <laughs> Are, the way we live are worlds apart. Um, last January, January 2013, I was speaking for a friend in Chicago in his church. And uh, I said to, to the people at that time, today is the first time that I can say I'm grateful for what I have experienced. Because up until then, I couldn't say that. I think that right now is the best and happiest season of my life. But I would never have had this happy season, this fulfilling season, if I hadn't gone through the worst season of my life. Dr. Schuler used to say, turn your scars into stars. That's what we've tried to do. A favorite Bible verse of mine says, These things that happen to you happen so that you can help someone else who's going through the same kind of circumstance. God wants to make you whole. He wants to give you joy. He wants to, you to see that even though you're going through very, very, very dark days, He's there. He knows. He's working. He's with you. I'm going to ask Jordan to uh, pass out uh, a prayer that I'd just like to pray with you. Uh, this is how I start my uh, every day. Uh, while, he's do while he's doing this, and I know I'm a little over time, do any of you have any questions you'd like to ask just before we uh, wrap it up here? How many kilometers do you have on your ring? Uh, What's the question? How many kilometers uh, do I have? In the years that I was driving, it was about four and a half or five years, I put on about, uh, about half a million kilometers. So it was, we did a lot of driving. Anybody else? Everybody got one of these? Okay, this is how I begin almost every day. And I would like you just to uh, pray it with me. Uh, so if you bow your head and just read this prayer, make it your prayer today as well. Let's pray. Dear Lord, may I take you with me, and I'd like you to pray aloud, may I take you with me today in my heart. May I do nothing that would grieve you. May I say nothing that I would be ashamed to say in your presence. May I think nothing that is unworthy and go nowhere where I would be ashamed to be seen by you. May the thought of your real presence dominate my life today. O oh God, I pray that you would bless me greatly 
and increase my influence, that your hand would be upon me, and that you would keep me from evil, and that I would not add to anyone's burdens today. You are in charge of everything that's going to happen to me today, whether it is good or bad, positive or negative. Make me thankful for everything that happens to me today. Amen. Thank you, men, for coming. God bless you.